I want to introduce Patrick Trailer. He is one of our favorite summer school uh, faculty members and also teaches at our boot camp. He is a partner in the Washington, D.C. offices of Hogan Lovells. He's uh, practiced for over 15 years in the areas of environmental and energy law, with particular emphasis on energy infrastructure development, air pollution law, and climate change. He's a member of the firm's environmental energy and project and international finance groups. His clients include globally recognized energy, utility, and manufacturing clients, which he advises on compliance with state, federal, and international environmental laws and treaties. And I've also asked Patrick to talk a little bit about, he and I both have something in common. We were born in East Texas, and here we are in Washington, D.C. So I asked him to say a few words about how he wound up going from there to here. Uh, yeah, I came to uh, I came to DC back in 1995 and did a master's degree in environmental law at George Washington University, and so I focused uh, there on Clean Air Act law, and from thence to the firm uh, immediately after that uh, that time in school, and then I have been there ever since practicing environmental law. So that's how I came to Washington from from Texas after finishing school uh, down there. So is that enough information? <laughs> So feel free to ask him more questions. You're well ahead of me where I, in your careers than I was when I was your age. So you're doing well so far. Well, shall we get started? Okay, excellent. Well, welcome everyone. I'm going to walk around a little bit. I can't stand to sit still and, and, uh, and, and just talk. <clears throat> um, so it seems that most folks here are with public interest groups. Let me just sort of get a, a better sense of who's here. So put your hand up if you are with a, a public interest group. Not, you know, ENGO, that kind of thing. Up high, so I can see him. All right, how about uh, government agencies? All right, and uh, private firms or companies, a few, and then other. Press, <laughs> others. All right, very good. It gives me, it gives me a good sense of, of who I'm speaking to during the during the fall and winter, right, we speak to the boot camp, which is sort of a group of mostly associates at law firms who are sent in by their partners to learn everything they can about environmental law in about three days. And so it's quite a different crowd, uh, and they have different things on their minds, They're being flogged by their partners, being one of them, uh, to, uh, to bill hours and to perform. So I'm hoping this is a more laid-back kind of a crowd, uh, not having those sorts of uh, problems foremost in your mind. But we're going to talk about the Clean Air Act today. And you know, I, I've given this lecture a number of times over the over the course of years, and I've, I've decided you can do it the easy way or the hard way. The, the hard way is for us to start with Section 101 of the Clean Air Act, and then put on our muddy boots and just slog straight through from the beginning to the end, and picking up as many sections as we can get through before the clock rings or you all fall asleep. That's the hard way. The, the easier way, which I really prefer, is to start with a simple question. And, it's, and it's, the question is, what is air pollution? Right? Let's start there first. Let's, let's start with what we're talking about when we talk about clean air. Right? Well, what's dirty about it in the first place that requires this statute and this regulatory program? So I have to spend a little bit of time, first of all, talking about air quality planning, with the first question being, well, what's air pollution? What is it that we are all talking about? Now, even though that's the easier way to do it, uh, you could still sit here for the next, you know, it's three hours, right? Three, no, no, okay, no, not three hours, all right. The time that we have together this afternoon, uh, I can do all the talking, and you might learn a thing or two and maybe be entertained by some of my really terrible jokes, but the best way this thing works is if you ask me questions as we go. So please don't feel um, shy about putting your hand up and, and asking questions. Now, I know that the first question can be a difficult one. The first one's always hardest. So be brave, show some courage, like I tell my five-year-old son, show some courage, right? <laughs> Think of a question that you like to ask, and at the right time, just put your hand up, and you will be rewarded for being the first person to ask the question. It'll go easier that way, that way we can have more of a dialogue than me just standing here for the next time, uh, and then just spouting all sorts of information you may find useful or not useful about the Clean Air Act. Okay, deal? We'll, we'll do it like that, instead of the, the hard, terrible, me talking the whole time way? All right, well good, with no further ado, let's begin. Uh, the, the conversation then. Let's talk first about, okay, I know this is going to work. I, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's going to work. There we go. I'm sure it's going to work. Okay. Good. All right. What is air pollution? I want to talk about five different air pollutants that Congress was particularly concerned about 
when it enacted the original Clean Air Act amendments of 1970. So it's a statute that has some long teeth, let's put it that way. And Congress was particularly concerned with these five air pollutants, call them criteria air pollutants, criteria pollutants. And the first one is something called particulate matter, particulate matter. Let's talk a little bit about the sources of, of PM, the first of many, many acronyms that we will discuss today. So PM, what is it? Well, it, PM comes from the incomplete combustion of carbonaceous fuels. I'll say that again, the incomplete combustion of carbonaceous fuels. And I have this beautiful picture here of a campfire, right? You've got some wood, which is a carbonaceous fuel. It's not, not a fossil fuel, you see. It's not fossilized yet, but it has carbon in it. And as that, as that carbon is then exposed to, to, uh, to oxygen and to heat, it begins to oxidize and combust. What, if you have a very low temperature fire, like a campfire or some sort of other fire that you might be able to build yourself, what you're going to do is a lot of the carbonaceous fuel doesn't get burned. Right? The, the combustion is, is, is pretty inefficient and, and very low temperature. And so what happens is a lot of that fuel flies off right, in the flue gases of the combustion. PM is one of those pieces of unburned fuel that sort of flies off. So you normally see it as smoke. So when you're seeing smoke, what you're seeing is, is PM. Now, PM takes <clears throat> a bunch of different kinds of forms as well, but that, that's the principal one that I want you to come away with today, is this, this notion of, of incomplete low temperature combustion causing uh, incomplete fuel, or fuel that's not been completely burned to sort of fly off into the air, and then to suspend itself as particulate matter. Now, technically, particulate matter can be smoke that kind of drifts along. It can be anything. It can be a cannonball flying through the air. I mean, technically, that's, that's a particle, right? And, and it's in the air for a time, right? But we're not talking about cannonballs. What we're talking about are the kinds of very, very small particles that you can breathe into your lungs. The problem with particulate matters in terms of the health effects are that... This is going to keep up with me. I'm, I'm confident this is going to keep up with me. Uh, the, the health effects are that the particulate matter gets breathed into human and animal lung tissue. The smaller the particle, the deeper it goes, right? So fine particulate, right, and ultra-fine particulate, very fine particulate, the, the, the finer it gets, the worse it is for your health because the deeper it penetrates into your lungs. One thing about the very, very fine particulates, they're not necessarily in completely combusted fuels, they are actually particulates that that's form when, when gas from combustion begins to adsorb onto small dust particles. And so you get all kind of all kind of nonsense chemicals on these things. Mercury, selenium, uh, acid gases, you get all sorts of materials in particulate matter that we then breathe deeply, deeply into our lungs, they have a hard time coming back out. And so the final the particulate, the different kind of sources of particulate cause real health impacts in terms of breathing these things into our lungs. I've got a picture here too of, a, of an old coal-fired power plant stack. You can sort of see, do I have a laser? I do have a laser, okay, a laser. <laughs> you can see uh, that you see this huge plume of smoke coming from this little smokestack right here. You've probably seen these as you're, as you're traveling right, in an airplane. You look down and you sort of see this, you know, this sort of thing drifting off into the, into the distance. Maybe you don't look for coal-fired power plant stacks when you're traveling. Maybe you've got better things to do when you're in airplanes. Maybe I'm just weird. But when I look down in an airplane, I see these things, I comment to my partners that are traveling with me if I need to, comment on the cleanliness or lack thereof of coal-fired smokestacks that we're passing over. And sometimes you'll see this kind of thing. And all that is is just unburned coal that's just flying off up in the air uh, in a lightly controlled sort of a way. So those are the sources of particulate matter. Now, I want to sort of introduce a term to you that you may remember from 10th grade chemistry, and that is stoichiometric combustion. Stoichiometric combustion is the sort of combustion where you take the carbonaceous fuel and you combust it so efficiently that all you have as a byproduct of the combustion process is heat, right, the energy from combustion, water, right, H2O, and this harmless little gas that we call CO2. Right? So if you have perfect combustion, right, that's what you're aiming for. You're aiming for water vapor and CO2 to be the byproducts. Non-stoichiometric combustion results in all kind of things coming off of it like this, right? Particulate matter and that kind of stuff. So remember, stoichiometric combustion is kind of the goal, right, of, of power engineers and combustion engineers when they're trying to squeeze every little bit of energy out of a unit of fuel. The first question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Is that uh, the concept behind 
Yeah, that's the concept behind clean coal. That's one of the concepts. Now, stoichiometric combustion, you can never really get to perfect stoichiometric combustion in something as large and inefficient as a coal-fired power plant, right? Um, automobile engineers aim for it more effectively. Maybe gas turbine engineers aim for it more effectively, right? So the combustion process itself in those devices, car engines and, and the natural gas turbines, they can be much more regulated, much more controlled, and they, they get closer to the goal, right, of stoichiometric combustion. But still, they only burn like half the carbon. I mean, they're still pretty inefficient as far as, as, far as combustion goes. Clean coal takes what is non-stoichiometric, right, and then tries to knock it out of the flue gas using, you know, sort of post-combustion controls, right? That's all they could ever really hope to do in terms of coal-fired combustion. Good question. Thank you for being brave, raising the hand. See, that now the ice is broken. Now everyone can have their questions flood to the front of the room. So PM, sources, health effects, uh, not really many environmental effects other than just sort of this kind of, you know, sort of smudgy nonsense that you see uh, in the air. The, the main impacts of PM, I don't want to discount environmental effects, of course, but the main health impacts are, are to human health. Yes, sir. Um, just briefly, what are a few of the main health impacts that you've practiced? Well, it's, it's, it's lung tissue damage. That's the big thing, asthma, right? And so I don't know if you saw the news this past week about, um, gosh, where was it? You know, EPA's new coal rule, maybe it's the mercury mac rule, going to cost $180 billion to the coal industry over time. And EPA says, yeah, but it's going to create $240 billion worth of, 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 of health improvements and save maybe 40,000 lives and X number of hospital admissions and that kind of, that's what they're talking about, particularly with PM, sorry, particularly with PM. They're talking about, right, asthma, and sort of cardiovascular related diseases uh, that result in early mortality and morbidity uh, that EPA hopes to avoid through more stringent regulation of these sorts of pollutants. Okay, let's move on then to our, our the next criteria pollutant that I want to talk about. Carbon monoxide, CO, CO. Sources, hmm, so I knew that was gonna happen. I was gonna push it one time and we were just gonna go crazy. Rebecca? Help. It's going crazy. Oh, it is? I think it saved up a bunch of my extra pushes and then it just unloaded them all at once. Okay, I think we're here. I think we're good. When you leave, though, it messes up. I'm sorry to say. All right. No, no, you can go. That's all right. You don't have to. You don't have to listen. Okay. All right. Carbon monoxide. Where does it come from? Also, inefficient, non stoichiometric combustion of carbonaceous fuels. Right? So you have an example here of this. Kind of cool, but really disgusting, old Volkswagen bug. And what happens with an old car like that is it is very inefficient in terms of, in terms of taking gasoline, I'm not even going to say diesel, gasoline in this old thing and converting it into locomotive force. My, my professor at George Washington University, uh, Arnold Reitze, uh, described an automobile engine as its primary function is the creation of air pollution with a side effect of moving a car down the road. I mean. <laughs> They're really inefficient as far as, as far as converting some fuel right, into locomotive energy, and, and this old car is even worse. So what happens here is, is you have a bunch of C, carbon, in the gasoline, uh, and you're supposed to fully oxidize the carbon in stoichiometric combustion, turning it into CO2, right? That's, that, that's evidence of stoichiometric combustion. Well, you don't get all of it combusted, and so you have incompletely oxidized C, and that comes out instead of CO2, just CO, CO1, right? So again, CO is the byproduct of inefficient, non-stoichiometric combustion. Health effects are that it is, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna like jump at me again here. Ah, it's deadly, right? Carbon monoxide will actually kill you if you breathe too much of it. What happens is your hemoglobin, sorry if there are any sort of pre-med students in the room or do, actual doctors, forgive me completely, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pretend like I'm a doctor. What happens is your hemoglobin, your, your blood cells, <coughs> go to your lungs and pick up CO, thinking that it's O2, right? So there's a job, go pick up the oxygen, carry it through your body. So what happens is those blood cells go up to your lungs, pick up the CO, fooled into thinking that it's O2, and go on their business and then try to release the CO to the tissue that it's trying to feed and, and can't get rid of the CO. The CO gets locked in to the blood cell, into the hemoglobin, and it actually poisons your blood. Actually poisons your, so it's not the kind of thing where you can breathe a bunch of CO and kind of feel lightheaded and run and get some fresh air, right? Your blood's poisoned. So if you breathe too much of it, you're cooked. 
right? So it is actually poisonous. So we don't want to breathe too much CO. That's the primary health effect of CO. And that is that it will kill you. I don't think we need to see any more about that, right? Nobody wants that. Nobody wants to stand behind that car and die, right? We sort of understand it if it runs over us, right? We don't, we don't take them off the road because they run over us and kill us, but we will take them off the road because they create too much air pollution. Kind of a weird thing in terms of how we view risk. Anyway, I won't get into that. Um, anyway, it will kill you. Environmental effects are somewhat insubstantial. It'll also kill anything else that has hemoglobin, right? So animals, for example. But in terms of the environmental effects like to plants or, or that sort of thing, uh, not so much. It's principally a health effect that we're concerned about and Congress was concerned about when it listed CO as a criteria pollutant in the 1970 uh, Clean Air Act Amendments. Any questions about CO? Non-stoichiometric combustion of carbonaceous fuels? The fact that you're not going, huh, means you're all very smart, which is why you have these great jobs this summer. Again, congratulations. <laughs> all right, moving on. Nitrogen dioxide, I'm going I'm to handle two. I'm going to handle sort of two criteria pollutants together here, right? Because they, they sort of do the same thing and they, and they sort of come from the same sorts of sources. They interact so closely together that I'm just going to handle them on the same slide. But, but there are actually two here. Nitrogen dioxide, NO2, and ozone. Ozone is O3. NO2 and ozone. Well, the sources, oddly enough, of nitrogen dioxide is stoichiometric combustion, really high temperature, very efficient combustion of carbonaceous fuels. What happens here is you're, you're really increasing the temperature of combustion. You're controlling the combustion process really well, so you don't have very much PM. So you see a really well-tuned car, you don't see a bunch of smoke billowing out of the back of it because those engineers have built that car to use the fuel properly and efficiently. Not perfectly, of course, but really, really well. So you don't see a bunch of PM flying out the back. You don't really see a ton of CO coming out of the back of a well-tuned engine. You see enough that needs to be controlled, but you see less of it than that old VW bug that we saw in the previous slide, right? So what we're talking about here is uh, closer to stoichiometric combustion. And one of the great ironies of air pollution control law and science is that you're trying to get rid of PM, you're trying to get rid of CO by making your combustion process more efficient. But as you do that, you do create less of those two pollutants, but you begin to create more of this pollutant. So one of the profound lessons, I think, in environmental law and policy, particularly in the Clean Air Act, it has the law of unintended consequences. There are no easy solutions to air pollution problems. By solving one problem, we almost always create a different problem. Sometimes we understand what the problem is ahead of time. Sometimes we find out about it afterwards, right? So if anyone comes to you and says, oh, here's what you need to do to fix air quality, or here's what you do to fix climate change, or here's a, right, fill in the blank, take a deep breath, take a step back, and realize this person probably doesn't know what they're talking about. Right? It's very, very difficult to have these sort of silver bullet solutions to these very complicated legal, social, economic, and technical scientific issues that we're confronted with in the area of environmental law and policy. And here's just one simple example of how a different kind of engine designed to eliminate one kind of problem ends up creating a different kind of problem. Well, why does it create this problem? Well, you know, these engines burn air, just atmospheric air, not really oxygen, they burn air. And air is some 78%, somebody will correct me, I'm sure, from 10th grade chemistry, or, world, or earth science, but 78 or so percent nitrogen. It's molecular nitrogen, most of that we breathe, in two. Well, at high enough temperatures, that molecular bond between those two N atoms breaks. And guess what? Those ends are really, really combustible. They really like to oxidize. They're easily oxidizable, and so they'll recombine with O's, and those ends don't get back together. They actually turn into NO something. NO2 is one of the things they turn into. They can also turn into NO, NO. NO1, right? NO, NO2, NO3, NO4. Those are the species of oxidized nitrogen. Altogether, we call those NOx. Right? The X means just a variable for one through four. NO2 is the criteria pollutant that Congress was most concerned about. And why were they concerned about it? Well, because it leads to the formation, in large part, of ground level ozone, O3. So you have so these N 
these, these N molecules, these NOx molecules, are very, very unstable. They don't live long in the wild. So they're going to get up into the atmosphere, and in the presence of other chemicals and heat from the sun, particularly on hot summer days, they're going to begin to undergo chemical reactions with all these other pollutants in the air and create smog. And, and smog includes a lot of ground level ozone. Yes, sir? Can you say that NO2 <clears throat> was one of the criteria pollutants? Uh, does that mean that the EPA didn't have to make endangerment findings to have those listed? Or Correct. Was it just listed by Congress? So it wasn't through promulgation of a rule. Whereas something like carbon dioxide, which they did make an endangerment finding, can't become a criteria pollutant? Yeah, we'll get, well, I have a whole slide on that process. Okay, but, they, so but, it, but Yes, they, the question was, for, for these criteria, for those on the phone, for the criteria pollutants, did the EPA have to make an endangerment finding like they did for CO2? The answer is no, right? For these criteria pollutants that we're talking about, Congress has listed them out in the Clean Air Act and gave EPA authority to add additional criteria pollutants. We'll get to one, the only one they've ever added. We'll get to that one in a couple of slides. Yeah, but this NO2, PM, CO, Congress identified those as the pollutants that they wanted to have regulated, right? Uh, early on in a, in a statutory way and gave EPA the ability to add more as, as circumstances warranted. So the health effects of ozone are profound, uh, principally to human health, but also to the environment. So ozone is highly reactive as well. O3 is also a very unstable, um, an unstable configuration of oxygen, and it is a strong oxidizer. So if you breathe a bunch of ozone into your lungs, that ozone is actually going to oxidize your lung tissue. If you breathe a bunch of it, it'll, it'll, it actually burns, right? It actually burns you. Now, you know, you're not breathing ozone and, and, and actually being burned, but you get my point at a sort of a cellular level, it actually will oxidize your cells in a way that oxygen itself doesn't do. So you don't want to breathe a lot of it. It can cause lung damage. It can exacerbate asthma. A lot of the same problems you have with PM, you also have with ozone. So when you have these ozone alerts, like today, I think, it's at least an orange day today. Anybody, anybody take a look at the weather today, find out what the air quality warning is. Is it red or is it orange? orange? Orange. So orange is not unhealthful for the general population, but it can be unhealthful for children, those with asthma, and the elderly. So today is a day where we have so much ozone flying around in the atmosphere that people that have health problems or don't have fully developed sort of bodily systems should avoid being outside today because of the level of ozone we expect uh, to be out there. So it, it actually is a, a real human health uh, concern. Environmentally, it does the same thing to crops. So if you have a, a, a crop that is in a high ozone area, that ozone will also oxidize the crop and make it less productive, and forests and everything else. So uh, it has significant environmental effects as well. So it has human health and welfare environmental effects um, uh, that, that, are, that are quite significant. Any questions then about, about nitrogen dioxide or ozone in terms of sources? Yes, ma'am. Is there some sort of connection between the two compounds, like one cause the other, or is it just associated? So are, is there a connection between the two compounds? The answer is yes, but I don't know exactly the chemistry. Okay. I've always heard it described as sort of this chemical soup, right, where you have pe uh, 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 combustion processes don't normally emit ozone. That's not normally a byproduct of combustion. They normally emit NOx, right? And because the NOx is so unstable, then it sort of in the presence of all of these other compounds, unburned hydrocarbons and so on and so forth in the atmosphere, particularly in the presence of heat, like on a hot day, will reconfigure themselves in chemical reactions, sort of endothermic chemical reactions to create ozone. And then the combination of NOx and ozone, is that smog or is smog just NOx? Uh, smog is sort of, uh, it's, it's not really a, a, the name of, of any particular chemical. Right, it's just sort of the chemical soup, the sort of you know smoky fog, smog. Right, it's just everything all jambled up together. Ozone, unburned hydrocarbons, PM. It's all sort of this hazy kind of mess. Right, and in that hazy mess, you have this kind of witch's brew of chemical reactions going on, including the formation of ozone. Right, I don't think that uh, NOx is formed through those processes. Those processes are are, are low energy enough processes that NOx is not going to be formed originally in any large measure. NOx is formed in high temperature combustion, not the very low energy, low temperature chemical reactions in the atmosphere. So what you'll see is more NOx turning into ozone, not other things turning into NOx. And that's about as far as I'm going to go with the science, so in terms of the actual chemistry of what's going on. Okay, moving on then. Next criteria pollutant. 
coming up. Yes, sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide. Well, the source of sulfur dioxide is a little bit different than the sources of these first four criteria pollutants that we're, that we're speaking about. Sulfur dioxide comes from the combustion of carbonaceous fuels that also contain sulfur and sulfur compounds. The principal one in this country is coal. Right? So all coal contains trace amounts, uh, up, measured in percentages sometimes, uh, but uh, you know, amounts of sulfur that's bound up in the coal itself. And so when that coal is combusted, whether it's non-stoichiometric or stoichiometric, stoichiometric combustion, it doesn't really matter how it's combusted, the S that's in the fuel is going to be oxidized with the air that's in the combustion process and turn into oxidized sulfur or, or SO2. So that's where SO2 comes from. Gasoline has sulfur in it, trace amounts, because they, they clean most of it out during the refining process. But just kind of raw gasoline, if it weren't cleaned up, would have a lot of sulfur in it. Diesel's got sulfur in it. Uh, fuel oil, um, uh, non-diesel fuel oil, it's got sulfur in it. Uh, the fossil fuels all have sulfur in them. And so when you combust them, they're all going to emit some level of, of SO2. So those are the sources of SO2. A little bit different, right? than sort of the chemical reactions that we see through sort of non-stoichiometric or high temperature combustion. This simply is a function of how much sulfur goes in to the combustion process with the fuel. The health effects of sulfur dioxide are, are, are not so great. It's not poisonous, right? It doesn't directly cause human health problems, but it does cause, it does cause acid precipitation. You got a little picture here, this really grayed out picture. This is somewhere in the Adirondacks and I guess in, in, in um, in New York State, and, and what happens with SO2 is it goes up into the atmosphere, and then it begins to combine with water vapor. So, anybody remember chemistry? Again, 10th grade, SO2 plus H2O equals what? H2SO4, sulfuric acid, right? So, SO2, when it goes into the atmosphere, is going to actually create sulfuric acid. And that sulfuric acid doesn't just stay up in the atmosphere forever, it, it comes down in the form of acid precipitation. Now notice I didn't say acid rain. That's one form of acid precipitation. But you can also get acid <laughs> snow, believe it or not. Acid snow. And my personal favorite, acid fog. I like that one. Think of this notion of this fog kind of rolling in, acidic, and you know, kind of creepy. Like that movie, The Fog, right? <laughs> Except then instead of dead pirates, they, you know, we have this, you know. Anyway, so sulfur dioxide. Acid precipitation, and it has a it has a profound environmental impact. I mean, you can see what happens. I mean, it it, it, it increases the the acid loading to streams and water bodies, and trees and plants take it up and then are unhealthy because of the acid added to the system. Uh, the other environmental effect that I'd point out is is uh, this sort of this this notion of regional haze. Take a look at this. This is a picture taken from the top of Skyline Drive in the Shenandoah Mountains, Shenandoah National Park. And I'm told that back in the 30s, from the top of Skyline Drive, you could see all the way to Washington, D.C., and see actually see the top of the Washington Monument on a, on a clear day. Well, look at this now. You've got this nasty smudge. This is not smog. Right? This is not ozone and, and NOx and that kind of thing. You find those in mostly uh, urban areas because a lot of cars are contributing. This is actually a regional haze created primarily because of the emission of, of SO2. So you get this environmental impact of reduced visibility. Visibility in the east is, is, is significantly impaired over natural conditions. When you go out west, you can see a, most places in the west, you can see a, a whole lot further than you can here in the east. So SO2 have primarily environmental effects and not so much human health effects. I will comment on one human health effect, though, that SO2 is one of those chemicals that when it's released in the atmosphere, can actually adsorb onto dust particles, right? And in its condensable phase, sort of form little uh, droplets, right, of water mixed with SO2 compounds and other sort of sulfur compounds, and they turn into very fine particulates. That's what this is. This is just sort of fine particulate that blankets the horizon. We, we breathe this stuff as well, and so SO2-related fine particulates also get breathed into the lungs as well. So there is a human health component of SO2 emissions, um, and I don't want to say which one is more important or more significant than the other ones. We have both. I think you think mostly about environmental effects of SO2 emissions, but in the last 10 years, we've been giving a lot more attention to the human health impacts of SO2 
principally because of their interactions with the formation of fine particulates and those impacts on uh, human lung tissue. Any questions then about SO2? It is more fun than starting with section 101. The purpose of the Clean Air Act shall be, and then kind of go into the whole thing. We could do that. Right? I wouldn't like it. I, I bet you wouldn't either. All right, sulfur dioxide. So those are the first five criteria pollutants that Congress identified in the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1970. Now there's one additional one that I want to talk about, and that's lead. Now lead wasn't on the original list of five. But as I said earlier, in response to the gentleman's question, Congress gave the EPA the ability to add criteria pollutants to the list. Um, and so in the late 1970s, EPA ended up adding lead as a criteria pollutant as a result of some litigation. Uh, I won't name the organization. Some of you work for the organization here today. Did a nice job of forcing EPA then to add lead as a criteria pollutant to the list. Well, where does lead in the atmosphere come from? Are we throwing pencils up in the air? Is that, I mean, what's going on? We're all shooting ducks and lead's flying? No. Where lead comes from is from leaded gasoline. Well, who put leaded gasoline in the car this week? Nobody, right? But we used to have a lot of it, right? In the 70s when we had this problem, we had a ton of leaded gasoline going into cars. And the, the, the principal control approach to, to lead air pollution, right, was to phase out the use of leaded gasoline. Why put lead in gasoline? It's not there naturally. It's, a, it's an additive, right? So we're adding lead to gasoline. Why do that? Because it actually helped even out the combustion process. It actually made the combustion process run more smoothly and your engine worked better. So it was, it was great engineers, oh, we just add a little lead to this fuel and, and make the car run better. Everyone would be happy. Unintended consequences. You see sort of how this is working out? Well, after lead was added as a criteria pollutant and, and, and we began to phase lead out, these engineers' children came up with a better idea. Instead of lead, we'll use something innocuous called MBTE. Well, we'll add that to the, to the gasoline instead, and that'll be perfect. And for a while it seemed perfect until we realized that MBTE was a strong groundwater contaminant, and that any tank of gasoline in the country that was leaking is going to just be shooting out MBTE like a plume out of it, and so they began to phase that out as well. Again, unattended consequences. Don't let anybody ever fool you into thinking there's an easy solution to a problem like lead air pollution. Oh, MBTE, it's a, it's a miracle chemical. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, ethanol. Yeah, perfect, right? We love ethanol, right? <laughs> Except, right? Food prices go up. People, you know, again, there, there are never any easy answers. There are winners and losers. Yes, sir. Well, this is the communications director here. I think you guys might be interested in knowing that the, uh, the, our current president, Leslie Crothers, is leaving soon. Was responsible for getting the lead out of gas. All right. Excuse me. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a real stroke. I mean, we, a lot of lead got put in the atmosphere through leaded gasoline. And now, you know, we don't use it anymore. Well, what's the problem with lead in the air? Well, again, right, it will kill you, right? We don't like lead being breathed. Uh, you know, we don't let our children lick lead paint for a reason. Uh, so, you know, breathing it deeply every day as you're going about your normal business is not a good idea. So, uh, principally health effects related to, to lead in the air. So those are the now six criteria pollutants subject to regulation under the Clean Air Act. So before we go on and begin to talk about how we regulate them, I'll stop here for questions about these six criteria pollutants. Yes, sir. Um, have there over the years been recent attempts, or I mean, what are some of the other um, pollutants that have been attempted to be uh, introduced or still on? Uh, well, most recently, CO2. Most recently, there are a number of environmental groups, principally, maybe some states, but primarily environmental groups, uh, have petitioned EPA to add CO2 to the list as a criteria pollutant. The EPA has uh, declined to do so, uh, so far. So it's not a criteria pollutant. And before that, gosh, I don't know exactly. I'm sure there have been a lot of other petitions for all manner of other pollutants that you know, a group or groups think would be important to add to this list. You'll see in a second, when we talk about this air quality planning, why it will be such a big deal to add anything to this. I mean, it's just been, what, it's been 41 years, right? We, we've got six, and only one in 41 years was added through a petition process like that. And, and that only as a direct result of, of litigation and an order from, uh, I think it was the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals and the lead excise cases. 
Yes, sir. Um, well, you probably can talk about it, but once like something is added to the list, how like, easily or how like how much can you get it? Yeah, once something added to the list, and we'll go over the next slides, what sort of what happens when it's added, it is a, it, it is a, a significant um, thing to add to the list because of the air quality planning implications that become automatic then, right, after, after a, you know, a compound is added to the list. So we'll spend a few slides going through what those things are, and you'll see it's a lot of regulation, a lot of economic impacts, a lot of displacement, you know, a big deal to regulate uh, a compound as a criteria pollutant. Any other questions about these air pollutants before we before we move on? All right. It seems a little warm in here. Does it seem warm in here? Yeah, it seems a little warm. Unfortunately, we have some fans, but that's best, okay. Best, all right. Well, I'm sorry I mentioned it because now we're all thinking it's warm in here. <laughs> I'll stop thinking about it. All right. I've got I've got a picture near the end of an iceberg, so we can all look forward to that at the end. <laughs> so when we do climate change intro slide, iceberg. So just think iceberg. All right. Let's talk a little bit then about, where's the laptop? Am I pointing it in the wrong direction? Ah, that's the secret. I'm pointing at the screen. Silly me. Why would I point at the screen? It's mute and dumb. Okay. All right, so what do we do? In terms of air quality planning, what do we do with these six criteria pollutants? Well, they get filtered into a process called air quality planning. We just sort of use that broadly. So what happens is, is Congress told EPA for each of these six criteria pollutants to figure out how much of them could be safely emitted into the ambient air. Right? So these are health-based standards. So each criteria pollutant, EPA is supposed to figure out how much of the criteria pollutant can safely be in a, a given amount of ambient air and not cause unacceptable human health impacts or environmental impacts. So that's section 107 of the Clean Air Act, where Congress gives EPA this instruction. Now, importantly, the costs of reaching that level of, of healthy air are not to be included in the analysis. So if the EPA were to say, well, no level of lead is safe, zero level, right? So the National Ambient Air Quality Standard the max for lead is zero, well, it doesn't matter how much it costs the economy to get to zero, the economy has to spend that amount of money getting to zero. So the costs of reaching these ambient air quality goals are not to be considered when EPA is thinking about what's a healthy level of these compounds in the air. And that's been very controversial because, I mean, they are truly health-based standards where cost is not really a part of what's going on. So uncertain science can be considered. So EPA doesn't have to have it exactly right in terms of understanding exactly that this level has this level of human health impact. And EPA has the ability to provide an adequate margin of safety in designating the NACs. Now, the NACs over the course of time have been, so how they are, how they are uh, expressed, I'll just go to the next slide here, make it a little bit easier to understand. They're expressed as concentration-based um, figures. So micrograms per cubic meter. So you take a cubic meter of air, right? And the question is, okay, how much SO2 can be in this cubic meter of air and still be healthy to breathe? How much ozone can be in a cubic meter of air and still be healthy to breathe? That's the question EPA asks itself, right? And so it is an ambient air, not inside air, not indoor air, but outside ambient air. So they're called national ambient air quality standards. Everybody got that in terms of what, what the NACs is, right? Well, in a fit of optim, yes, ma'am. Considering um, how much um, of these pollutants can be in the air, do they consider cumulatively? You know, if you're looking at one, it could be X, but if you're looking at two different um, pollutants and they might be in the same cubic space, yes, that might make a difference. But how much of each of each is? Yeah. So what? So the question is, are they considered cumulatively or just pollutant by pollutant? Yeah. By pollutant? Mm -hmm. The answer is they're they're considered pollutant by pollutant. So you have a separate NACs for each of the six criteria pollutants. But if there is some interaction between them that causes the same kind of health impact, I suppose EPA and maybe they have. I mean, the science underlying the NACs determinations is way too deep. For, for me to even understand, much less try to teach, right? So it may be that EPA considers sort of synergistic effects of various pollutants when they're setting the NAAQS levels. But as a matter of law, they're set pollutant by pollutant, 
right? And then in that scientific process, maybe they talk to each other, but, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it is an important point that I neglected to make, that, that each criteria pollutant has its own NACs, its own NACs. Well, in a fit of optimism, the Great Society Congress said, well, we're going to, this is 1970, remember, right? 1970. All of these are going to be met by 1975. So economy, you have five years to have perfectly healthy air across the country. That's right, LA, all the way to New York City, right? You've got five years to get it cleaned up. Well, I mean, it's a great goal. It's a great goal, but a little bit, uh, yeah, too much of a stretch. Too much of a stretch. We have a lot of areas in this country that are still not achieving these knacks for various pollutants. Now, in fairness, EPA keeps lowering the number, right? as new scientific information comes to light. So areas that used to actually meet the, the NACs now don't meet the NACs because the science about impacts of these chemicals on human health has improved and the number continues to go down. It never goes up, it always sort of seems to, to go down. So what happens then once EPA has set the NACs on a criteria pollutant by criteria pollutant basis, the question then is whether this cubic meter of air has more or less than that max amount of the chemical. If it has less than that cubic meter of air, right, just in a real small way, is said to be, quote, in attainment with the NAX. If it has more than the NAX level, it's said to be in non-attainment with the NAX. You have this notion of attainment and non-attainment. If you're in attainment, you're breathing a healthy amount of whatever pollutant we're talking about here, right? Right, according to EPA, trust them if you like. If, you, if you're a non-attainment, then you are breathing an unhealthy amount of, of that pollutant. Again, set by EPA, trust them if you like, right? So attainment, non-attainment, healthy, unhealthy. So on a day like today here in DC, where we're at a code orange day, we're, we're getting up close to the level of unhealthy ozone in a cubic meter of air here in the DC metro area. Not quite the unhealthy, right? Not quite to the next, but getting close to it but still in attainment, technically. Still in attainment with the ozone NACs. And every five years, EPA is supposed to review these NACs, use the best available information, the best new science, and then to see whether those NACs ought to be modified or not. Yes, sir? Where do they take that sort of measurement in a city like Washington? That's a good question. Where do you take the measurements of the, the cubic meters of air? So EPA has this set of regulations, which I have never read, They're about this thick, Right? And they, they have all the rules on how you collect this ambient air quality data. What they, in essence, do is they have monitoring stations set up all through an area, and we'll get into what the area is in a minute. These monitoring stations set up th through the area, and they collect ambient air quality data for these different criteria pollutants. And they have this complicated data system by which, I don't even want to say the word average. They're not really even average, but all those numbers are brought together in some sophisticated statistical analysis, right? Probably this much of the regulation describes how to do that, right? And I'm terrible at calculus and math. That's so when I see those little symbols, right, the ones that look at E's, you know, I panic. I close the book, right, and I go read some trash fiction because that, that sort of stuff really frightens me, and I'm no good at it. So, but that's what those regulations are. So there's a series of monitoring stations. The data collected is somehow processed in some meaningfully, statistically correct way to then spit out, okay, here is the area's right, reading uh, to compare to, to the NAGs. That is an unsatisfactory answer, I know, but that, that's all I can give you. All right, so that's the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Any more questions about the NAGs? <coughs> yes, sir. I've heard a lot about the primary versus, you have the primary versus secondary. Yes. Can you speak to that? Mm -hmm. I do have a, a note on my slide, primary versus secondary, that I neglected to, to talk about. What are primary versus secondary NACs? Primary NACs are generally related to human health. Secondary NACs are generally related to what's called welfare, right? So welfare means environmental impacts, impacts on crops, impacts on wildlife, you know, sort of secondary effects not directly impacting humans. Right? but impacting humans in an indirect way because of our enjoyment of the environment, our ability to use the environment for our own purposes. Now, if they're different, but they're still measured on the same micrograms per cubic meter? They can be different, and I don't, I don't have my max chart memorized in terms of primary versus secondary. I want to say this, but I could be wrong. I want to say that we have primary NACs. The secondary NACs are not nearly as stringent. Right? So the primary NACs are what really drives, like for example, air quality permitting. You very rarely go and find that you're in that you're in attainment with a primary NAC. In fact, I don't, I don't think you ever do. 
find that you're in a team with a primary NAC and then find a secondary NAC that's more stringent, right? So the primary NAC in, in most practical ways drives sort of the attainment and non-attainment decision. It's become important in the idea of carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide doesn't have very many, if any, real direct impacts on human health other than suffocating because you have too much of it. But in terms of the amount that we have in the atmosphere because of you know, uh, combustion of fossil fuels, that's not the kind of impact we're talking about. So the question is whether there is any really adverse impact to primarily to human health from CO2. They seem to all be right, secondary, sort of welfare-related impacts, flooding, storms, heat, you know, those sorts of things. Right? So it's an important debate for CO2, less important in many ways for the other, oh, less important for the criteria pollutants. But well, we would never set a max for CO2 since it's not a criteria. Correct. So. Not at least yet. All right, moving on then. So we have NACs. We have lots of, we have lots of acronyms. Right, we've got PM, CO, NOx, ozone, SO2, lead. You can call it PB if you like, but I just call it lead. You know. And then you have NACs. Now you've got NACs. So these will all begin to roll around in your mind, and you'll understand me when they begin to roll off my tongue in long sentences full of acronyms in a moment. All right, so how do you achieve these NACs? And now we know what the goals are. Now we know what the bad stuff is, where it comes from. Right? We know that we can't do without it. I mean, we're not going to not drive cars, at least not now, given the technology we've got. We're not going to turn the lights off and not burn things for power, at least not yet. So you can see you have to have some processes in a modern society that creates these sorts of air pollutants, but we also understand that they're not healthy, and so EPA is saying, well, here's how much we can have to be healthy. How do you then achieve those healthy levels of air pollution across the country? Well. Section 107 of the Clean Air Act divides the entire country into what are called AQCRs, or Air Quality Control Regions, AQCRs, right? So it's not, is the whole country in attainment or not? It's, is an AQCR in attainment? AQCRs generally follow pre-existing political boundaries. I want to say as a general rule, kind of county level divisions. There are some exceptions. We live in the DC metropolitan area, and it's actually an interstate AQCR, Northern Virginia, uh, Maryland, and then, and then D.C. Philadelphia's got one. You know, cities that live on the borders of other states often have multi-state AQCRs. But in general, EPA is trying to carve out these AQCRs that match pre-existing political boundaries. All right? So th the question is asked, is the AQCR in attainment or non-attainment? Now, it can be in attainment with SO2 and non-attainment for ozone. In attainment for PM non-attainment for whatever else, NO2. So it's attainment, non-attainment is figured out on an individual criteria pollutant basis at the AQCR. So the gentleman's question in the back about, well, how do you figure out what the air quality is? Those monitors are all sort of in an AQCR, and only those monitors sort of inside the AQCR in general, again, having not read all of this regulation, in general, those are the monitors that are going to be referenced when you're figuring out whether or not the air quality in the AQCR achieves or doesn't achieve the NACs, right? Yes, ma'am. What happens when um, there's attainment in part of a air quality control region, not in another? Yeah. What 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 happens when one monitor is just going crazy with a bunch of really high readings and people are choking near it, right? And another one, oh, everything's fine. Well, that's where you get this statistical treatment of all of the data, right? Um, so we're, I mean, you wouldn't like to see that. You wouldn't like to see some area that's, I mean, literally unhealthy to breathe, right? And then another area very healthy to breathe, and then you just sort of wave your hands and say, well, the average is X. But that's in fact what we do. We have some sort of statistically meaningful method of of evening out various readings from across the AQCR in terms of the monitoring system. Now, again, I'm not an expert in it, uh, but there is some sort of way of of calculating in a statistically meaningful way what the AQCR's air quality is supposed to be. Now sometimes if you, have, if you have adverse impacts from a particular source, let's say you live downwind for some industrial source, uh, oftentimes the local, the local air quality agency will require that source to install an air quality monitor right downwind of it. And if there is a violation of the NACs that's attributable to that source, then that source can be made to do something about it. Right? So we have, for example, in Old Town Alexandria, an old coal-fired power plant. And the neighbors, just downwind of the thing, have been complaining bitterly for years that it's polluting their neighborhoods. And so as a part of that regulatory process, that facility has installed a number of 
air quality sensors in the neighborhood down gradient, and then as a result of the data collected, they agreed to undertake some pollution control measures. Right? So when you have a hot spot like that, that's probably the best way to handle it, not in some sort of way of, it's not handled so well in the AQCR monitoring uh, provision. That's more of a, a broader look at the AQCR, and not sort of source specific kinds of looks. Is that helpful? Okay, all right, maybe more than you wanted to know. Old Town, what, what is he, he's going crazy. No, I'm oh, sorry, I get distracted. Yes, ma'am. What happens if a region isn't in attainment? Is there some kind of thing? I have a slide on that. <laughs> I do. What happens if they're not in attainment? I, I, I have a slide. Okay. So what happens after you divide the whole country up to the AQCRs and you ask the question, attainment, non-attainment, attainment, non-attainment, non -attainment, what happens is each state, each state is supposed to develop a regulatory plan, state statutes, state regulations, state guidance documents. So this is state law that is designed so that each AQCR in the state achieves and maintains attainment with the, with the AQCR for every criteria pollutant. Right, you got that? Every state develops a state implementation plan, which is a creature of state law, designed so that each AQCR in the state achieves and maintains the NACs for every criteria pollutant. That sounds like almost more than half acronyms. So if you follow what I said when I said it twice, congratulations. I mean, you're, you're learning sort of the arcana of, of the Clean Air Act. Why the states? Why does the EPA just come in and tell the states what to do? Well, Congress here was very wise. The, 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 uh, the Clean Air Act is based on a principle called cooperative federalism. Now, sometimes it's more or less cooperative, as Texas sometimes notices. Uh, but mostly it's cooperative. Mostly what happens here is Congress and EPA set the goals for air quality, and the states then are left to make the hard decisions on how to, how to execute those goals. The federal government doesn't want to get too much in the state's business in terms of picking winners or losers. So a state can decide, well, we really like our, our steel mill jobs, so we are going to take it a little bit easy on the steel mill, right? And then over here, we're going to really sort of clamp down on a chemical process or chemical manufacturing. Local decisions like that are local decisions. It's the, what kind of jobs you want, what kind of economy do you want, what kind of workers are suited for your particular area. These are really left to state and local governments. EPA is not going to come in, in most cases, and tell a state, well, sorry, you know, your, your, steel, your steel business has to go away because your air quality is too bad. They want those decisions to be left with the states, hence this notion of cooperative federalism. So EPA sets the direction, and then the states pull together the SIP, the state implementation plan, which then achieves the federal goals. Does that make sense? You understand how that sort of works in cooperative federalism? Okay. All right. Any questions about that? That's, I mean, that's a, a high-level review of sort of what that looks like, but, uh, but I think it's, I think it's a, a fair overview of, of how the program works. Yes, sir? So who pays for the implementation? The states. The question is who pays for implementation? The states. So many states, like Texas, will describe these as unfunded federal mandates, right? You're just cramming this stuff down on us, and you're hooking us up, and you won't give us our federal money for highways and such. Until we do this, we have a better way of doing it. We, you know, so a lot of states complain that the feds don't give enough money, right, for the state to actually implement these programs. And EPA continues to move the goalposts and continue to press down additional goals. And so you can see how a lot of states begin to complain about how much cooperation there really is in this cooperative federalism sort of an approach. I appreciate Texas' perspective. I'm, I'm from Texas. I get it. I still get angry when I have to get a sticker for my car to park on the street. Like, come on, it's my street. It's in front of my house, a sticker. Anyway, don't get me started on my Texas blood boiling at sort of perceived insults. All right. So the states submit their SIPs to EPA for approval. So here's the cooperation again. States can't write just whatever they like. They have to actually write laws that EPA says, okay, if you do this, this is consistent with how the Clean Air Act is supposed to work. And then if the SIP meets the requirements of the SIP, which are set forward in Section 110 of the Act, EPA can approve it. Approve it in whole, approve it in part, make comments on it. So there's kind of a negotiation that kind of go back and forth between EPAs and the states in terms of whether the SIP is adequate, right, to implement the goals of the Clean Air Act. If the SIP is just so bad that it doesn't even doesn't even work at all, or the states refuse to submit one, then EPA can do what's called a federal implementation plan. This is the sort of uncooperative part of cooperative federalism. EPA can say, well, look. You can do it yourself, you can make your own decisions, 
or we can decide for you who gets permits, who doesn't get permits. And we have our little regional permitting staff up here of three people, and they're going to process all the permits for your entire state. Normally, states will go back to the drawing board and create a SIP so they can at least maintain at least a semblance of control over their own permitting decisions. Now, until this year, I could say with some confidence that EPA has never promulgated what we call an unfriendly FIP, right? This sort of thing where state, you've really fallen down on the job, we're going to come in and do it for you. Well, this past year, in the beginning of 2011, Texas refused to implement EPA's new greenhouse gas rules, their new greenhouse gas uh, PSD permitting rules. Uh, the, the governor on down said, that's ridiculous, we're not going to do it, we're not going to have that in Texas. And EPA says, oh yes, you will have this in Texas, and so here's your unfriendly FIP, right, where EPA Region 6 in Dallas, Texas is going to run the state's air permitting program. So they're still working it out. They're still working it out. But, uh, you know, you, you can come to, come to blows in this cooperative federalism context. Uh, and EPA can be quite serious about its, its need. Now, I've forgotten exactly where this dispute between Texas and EPA stands. Maybe Texas has gone ahead and promised to do a SIP revision. Maybe they haven't. Uh, I've not followed the news on that. Anybody know where, where exactly are they? Anybody happen to know? Aren't they seceding? Aren't they seceding? <laughs> They've done that once before. Uh, it didn't work out so well. All right. Although the government ran for president, I read this morning. Anyway, we'll see. Yes, sir. The air permit program. So permits for construction, permits for operation of air sources within the state. We'll get into a little, little more detail about sort of how that works in a little bit. Yes, ma'am. I'm a little confused about the greenhouse gas permit mm -hmm. in Texas because I thought that the SIP only applied to NACs and then the NACs only deal with the six criteria of food and then the PSG program was just for attainment areas. So I, yeah, so. The, the, I don't understand that in why yeah. they had <coughs> permits for greenhouse gases under the Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good question. The question is, well, hold on. I thought that you, you just gave an example of greenhouse gas permit programs being in the SIP, but, but you're talking about how the NACs are what are in the SIP, and I've left some confusion I can see. So the SIP is much broader, who we'll see, it includes a lot more programs than just the criteria pollutant air quality planning section. So as we sort of get through these slides, we're sort of taking a bigger and bigger and bigger picture. So the SIP includes all of the requirements of the Clean Air Act, that a state is supposed to implement, including air quality planning, but not just air quality planning, right? So it also includes the New Source Review Prevention of Significant Deterioration Permitting Program, under which these new greenhouse gas regs come in. So the SIP includes that, as well as general provisions on, uh, on air quality planning for criteria pollutants. So the SIP is much broader than just NACs. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Moving along. So here are just a few things, right, that the SIP has to have in it. We won't go over these in detail, but th they're sensible, right? You have to be able to impose enforceable emission limitations on sources of air pollution in the AQCR. Otherwise, what are we doing? Well, please, pretty please, will you reduce your emissions of NOx? Well, that's not going to cut it, right? Enforceable emission limitations as a matter of state law. You have to collect air quality data. We've talked a little bit about how you do that in an ambient context. Enforcement provisions, so if that big steel company says, go jump in the lake, then the air quality control agency can come in and say, no, no, you go jump in the lake, and then you're in court, <laughs> both telling each other to jump in the lake, and then we'll see who wins. <laughs> we have to prohibit sources from contributing to non-attainment. So my example of Alexandria, you can't have a source that is known to contribute to non-attainment in an area. That source has to, you know, the states have to be able to shut that source down or require it to control its emissions in a more effective way. You have to be able to collect emission data from the sources. You can't just guess at what's being put up in the atmosphere. You have to know. So you have to have provisions by which these sources have to monitor and report their emissions data to the states. And then every once in a while, you have to revise your SIP to make sure that you're up to speed with all of EPA's latest and greatest requirements. Those are the general provisions of what needs to be in a SIP. It's a whole lot more complicated than that. Section 110 is a whole lot longer than this. And the SIP regulations, uh, part 51, uh, 40 CFR are, are very, very detailed. But this is a good overview. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you say prohibited sources from contributing to non-attainment, can that cross state lines? Or can state access downwind of state wide? Does that have to say that somebody writes, say, statewide as power plants or if they are? 
Yes, the question is, well, how about interstate, right, or, or cross-AQCR pollution? What can an AQCR do about pollution that's coming from another AQCR and that kind of thing? These are really good questions. I should write these down because I could probably make my slides a little bit better by addressing these sorts of questions. So thank you, but I don't have time to write them. I'll try to remember them, though. Uh, yes, so the Act in Section 110 has provisions dealing with interstate and, and cross-AQCR pollution. So let's say you, you're New Hampshire, right, and you really like clean air, and you've really driven all of your industry out of the state. I'm, I'm kidding. They didn't really drive all the industry out of the state. But they have really clean air. They, they've been very, very stringent. They have a strong regulatory program. Nevertheless, right, they still have some bad air quality, not because of sources in their state, but because of sources that are upwind of them, principally sources in the Ohio River Valley burning coal, or all this sort of small, not small, but regional haze and knocks and whatnot kind of floats with prevailing winds up towards the northeast. So Section 110 has a provision by which New Hampshire can go to EPA and say, EPA, you need to call in Ohio's SIP and make them change it to be more stringent so that our air quality doesn't suffer. It's called a SIP call. That proceeding is called a SIP call. So a downwind state or even, I guess, an AQCR, but they're normally interstate kinds of, of, uh, of issues, uh, can go to EPA and say, yeah, go to that other state over there and make them do a better job. They may be fine. Here's what happens. Let's just, let's just talk honestly here for a second. Companies aren't dumb, right? Engineers are not stupid people. And so if the, if the requirement is that the local air quality, the local AQCR needs to be clean, and you're contributing, say, a bunch of knots because of your coal-fired power plant emissions, because they're coming out of your stack, one way to solve that problem is to build a really tall stack and put big fans in it so that you blow the stuff straight up into the, into the stratosphere and it doesn't come down around your plant, right? Wow, right? But it blows over to New Hampshire, right? So you don't really get away with anything. I mean, eventually that's going to have to be controlled. So tall, tall stacks like that were designed in part to make sure that we didn't have local air quality impacts from those sorts of combustion sources. But you do now have these interstate impacts, right? And now global impacts uh, that, we're, that we're beginning to be more concerned about. Uh, and a tall stack is not going to help you with, with those sorts of things. So, yes, there can be some communication back and forth through EPA between states that are upwind and downwind. Yes, sir. So, I realize that uh, SIP is a, an entity of state law. Um, does the federal government or EPA uh, maintain uh, enforcement authority federally uh, concurrently to bring enforcement of permits? And do citizens still have the citizen supervision from the federal law to bring in federal court? So the question is, because the SIP provisions are actually creatures of state law, what enforcement rights do the federal, does the federal government have and then citizens groups have to enforce those state law provisions? Under the Clean Air Act, EPA has what's called overfiling authority. So anything that's in the SIP that's approved by EPA is also enforceable by EPA. And if a state refuses or fails or doesn't have the resources to enforce its own state law, EPA can overfile, right, and then enforce state law, right, against the, uh, against the, uh, the, sort of the alleged violator. Likewise, private attorneys general, citizen groups under the Clean Air Act, can also enforce those state laws. But they're not enforced in state court. EPA doesn't enforce in state court. EPA actually enforces in federal courts. The Clean Air Act gives federal jurisdiction, right, so you're in the federal courts. When EPA brings a claim against a, a facility or a source under state law, it's actually bringing that claim in federal court. So you wouldn't run into the 11th Amendment ex parte young problem? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't, I mean, the overfiling doesn't run into those sorts of problems. Ex parte young has been about 20 years ago. In, in, in the deep, deep back of my mind somewhere. Yeah, so, but, but EPA and citizens both have the ability, right, to use federal courts. Right, federal courts have sort of original jurisdiction uh, to handle these sorts of state law violations. Yes, ma'am. What is the relationship between the SIP call and the good neighbor provision? Um, I I yeah, tell me more about the good neighbor provision. Um, tell me about how you have to have something in your SIP that you will not contribute to the reduction of air quality and downwind state. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same thing, but I mean, having sort of, oh yeah, we'll be a good neighbor, and actually being required to be a good neighbor are two different things. So this, the SIP call provision is the mechanism by which a bad neighbor can be forced to be a good neighbor, regardless of whether it's promised in its SIP to be a good neighbor or not. Yeah. Okay. There's a question from the internet. 
I'm like a talk show host. <laughs> I, should do, I should do this. All right. Okay, here's the question. Can Patrick give a quick summary overview of what regulations are included in a state SIP? Yes, I can. It is slide 11. Slide 11. I know this is probably about five minutes old, so thank you, caller, for the question. I think I've answered it uh, with, with, with slide 11 here. And section 110 of the Act uh, gives all the details, and part 50 of 40 CFR gives more than details than you want to know in terms of what has to actually be in the state SIP. Okay, let's move on. Okay, a couple of really brief examples of, of what might be in a SIP in, in more detail. So ozone. Let's say you're in a, you know, let's talk about ozone for a second. Uh, the AQCR can be divided into a bunch of different kinds of non-attainment areas, marginal non-attainment, all the way to severe and extreme non-attainment. We're not going to go through all these in detail. You can sort of relax. Or not, or just spend a moment on the slide. I just want to give you the point that all the associates that come to boot camp, they have to suffer through this. So just be glad that you're not there. So what, we, what, what happens, though, is the worse the air quality gets, the more stringent requirements in the SIP have to be. So you've got severe extreme 182, enhanced offset, you have reduced vehicle miles traveled, Fewer private cars, more buses. Texas loves that kind of stuff, right? Fewer private cars and pickup trucks? What are you talking about? But, but the point is the SIP is supposed to, supposed to get more and more stringent the worse and worse the air quality gets in an AQCR. Any questions about that? I, mean, we didn't, I gave you just a very short overview of that. I just want to make sure you have the, the, the principle. Okay, so let's say that you are in an AQCR that is in attainment for the criteria pollutants. Let's so just say all of them to make it easy. You are, what, you are in what's known as an attainment area, and the permitting program that applies to you in that area is called the Prevention of Significant Deterioration Program. So Congress says, well, we want those areas to, to stay clean. And the goal is to make them healthy. Right? You have a healthy one, congratulations, but let's not, let's not foul it. Right? Let's, let's keep it clean. Let's prevent significant deterioration of air quality. So the AQCR then is designated as a class one, a class two, or a class three attainment area. Class one would be things like um, national parks, right? So sort of areas of real pristine air quality that we really don't want to adversely impact uh, through air pollution, visibility primarily, but other air pollution as well. We want to really keep those areas uh, really pristine. Class two areas, uh, well, class three areas would be areas like, I don't know, like Newark, New Jersey, where you don't really care so much, it could be kind of a big air pollution sink. No, I'm kidding. We don't really treat New Jersey that way. There are no really, there are no class three areas. Everything else is class two. So it's either a national park or everything else, right? So class one, class two areas. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to make sure that you don't add so much air pollution to those AQCRs that you that you bring those areas into non-attainment. And uh, I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for our greenhouse gas discussion. So I'm just going to sort of pass over the details. But what happens in these, in these areas is there is a, a permitting program that requires uh, new sources or modified sources in these attainment areas to go through a pre-construction review process to make sure that when that facility is constructed and operated, it doesn't cause the AQCR uh, to fall into non-attainment. It is a very sophisticated, complex, permitting process, and you can't even begin to construct the source until you have your permit in hand. You don't build it until you get a permit. You can't even, in many ways, it's an overstatement, but you can't even break ground right, on the source until you have the, uh, the PSD pre-construction permit. And that's the way then that the states and the feds make sure that you don't adversely impact air quality in the AQCR by adding sources willy-nilly. Everybody got that, at least in general terms? There are a lot of details to the PSD permitting program, a lot of details. We don't have time, obviously, to go through them here. There's a three-day course that you can go to that teaches you everything you want to know about new source review, permitting. We don't have that luxury here, obviously, today. Uh, but the takeaway is pre-construction <coughs> permitting in PSD areas to make sure that those areas don't fall into non-attainment. Questions in passing on, uh, on the PSD permitting program? In a SIP-approved state, of course, the state's doing this permitting. Right? And non-SIP approved state EPA is doing the permitting. In an unfriendly FIP, EPA takes over the permitting. But in most parts of the country, states have approved authority uh, to run this program, which is a good thing. Okay. Well, what if a state says, well, we don't care. We don't care about NACs. We don't care about SIPs. We're just not going to do it. You know, we don't really care um, about this air quality program you've got here. What are you going to do about it? 
here's a slide I was going to tell you about. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud of the graphic. No, I'm not. It's, it's a silly graphic. I, I'm embarrassed by these slides. I put them together so long ago, they're, they're really awful. I keep telling myself, I'm going to put together some real modern slides, some really cool ones. I never get around to it. I'm sorry. So that was a really, really cheesy sort of motion, I, I know. Anyway, there they are. They marched in, the Army. Um, so four things. Four, four things that EPA can do. Number one, this is the thermonuclear device. This is the Shia nuclear bomb. Right? This is the Iranian nuclear bomb of the Clean Air Act. Right? Federal highway funding restrictions. This terrifies everybody. Right? This is the sort of thing that you never actually have to threaten to get states to line up. So Winston Churchill used to say that the way he liked to make his martinis is he would take the gin and the tumbler, right? add the gin and the tumbler, and then glance briefly across the room at a closed bottle of vermouth and then mix his drink. Right? So just gin was his martini. It's kind of like that. So when the administrator of EPA just sort of looks across the room at the closed bottle of federal highway funding restrictions, right? The states, oh, okay, okay, got it, got it, got it, okay, we'll give you a sip that works. So EPA's never had to use that, uh, not even really a, an affirmative threat of using that, and states would generally line up and, uh, and, and, and get in line with, with SIP revisions. Texas being the obvious <laughs> exception recently with GHGs, but even then, EPA didn't threaten the federal highway funding restrictions. You wanna see a congressional delegation just light up on fire? Right? You threaten this kind of thing. Right? This has to be a big, big deal for this to happen. All right. But what EPA did do, though, is this unfriendly FIP. So EPA did FIP uh, Texas. So the creation of a federal implementation plan and direct control of all the AQCRs, in that case, in Texas. That's a tool, that's a tool in the toolbox, and that's the one that EPA pulled out. Right? Wishing it could glance briefly across the room at the thermonuclear option, but didn't. Uh, fourth, EPA can make it more difficult for new sources to get permits. Right? Uh, so these last two, um, they, they can increase the number of offsets that a new source has to get. We're not going to have time to go into it. I'm sorry, but it makes it much more difficult, much, much, much more difficult to build a new source in these areas. Or EPA can just say no more construction permits, period, in the state. So economic growth comes to a screeching halt as far as EPA is concerned. So big tools, right? big sticks uh, that EPA has got to make sure that a state implements uh, the, the SIP requirements of Section 110. Any questions about those, those, those four tools? Rarely used, the fact that they're in the toolbox is typically good enough to make states line up, pay attention, and give EPA SIPs that are approvable. Yes, ma'am. When you say no more construction permits, they're not giving construction permits under the Clean Water Act or under all of the acts that EPA... Air. Air. Air only. I mean, I'm sorry, air. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's it. So... I mean, if you are, uh, I don't know, name the, name the small source that needs a, a pre-construction permit under the Clean Air Act. It doesn't take much to be a major source under the Clean Air Act. And if EPA says, nope, can't build that, why not? Well, no real reason why you couldn't get the permit, just your state's fooling around <laughs> and not doing its program correctly. Go talk to the governor, right? Well, you can see how that can get contentious. <clears throat> All right. So... Let's take a step back. Review of air quality planning. So first we did what's air pollution, and then we did a review of air quality planning. Section 108, Congress lists the criteria of pollutants and authorizes the EPA to add extras. Section 109, is where we set the NACs for these criteria pollutants. So 107, is where we get the AQCRs. 110, that's how we work through the process of getting SIPs that are approvable. Section 160 through 169 are all the attainment area requirements. I gave you one little slide and kind of two slides and kind of briefly through, flew through them, but there are a lot of sections that deal in detail with what's going on. Sections 171 through 93, non-attainment area requirements. Much more stringent because the goal there, of course, is to bring the area into attainment. That takes more work than just keeping the area in attainment from slipping into non-attainment. So these restrictions here are, are much more vigorous in 171 through 193. Now, Rebecca mentioned a, a piece of paper or a little memo, uh, and we posted it on the ELI webpage. So if you go to this lecture, you ought to be able to get the slides and this little memo. The memo is sort of what I call my deep dive into the Clean Air Act. So every time I say something like, but we don't have time, or I wish I could, but you can go to this memo, and what I've done is I've listed all the different sources that I would refer to to understand more about the Clean Air Act. So online sources, news sources that I rely on frequently to make sure I keep up with what's going on. Um, Hornbook kind of sources that give a really great overview of the Clean Air Act. A couple of court cases that I think are particularly good examples of how a court thinks through permitting programs and all the different requirements of permitting programs. So if you're interested in sort of doing a deeper dive into what's going on, 
uh, getting references to all of the regulations that are going to be talked about uh, in briefly in, in this lecture. You can go there to the ELI website under this lecture and pull down that brief. It's two or three pages worth of just lists of categorically uh, organized uh, resources that you can turn to if you want to know more about, uh, about the Clean Air Act. Yes, sir. Yeah, no, there, there, are, there are specific sections in the Clean Air Act that authorize both EPA and citizen suit enforcement of all the requirements of the Act. The states also have their own concurrent and, in, in many ways, primary enforcement authorities under their own state laws. Yeah, but there are significant sections. I guess the reason I don't have enforcement on this, just as a matter of, of history, is we have an entire enforcement lecture, right, either in summer school or at least in boot camp. So I, I've not really gotten much into enforcement of these things because there's, there's a whole separate lecture, all the environmental laws enforcement. But it's, a, it's an oversight, I think, here not to have at least a slide on, on enforcement uh, powers of EPA. So it's a good question. Yes, EPA can enforce all of the requirements as well as citizens enforcing virtually all of the requirements. And, of course, states enforce their own state laws that they enact and promulgate under their, under their SIPs. Okay, so that's a, a review of the air quality planning program of the Clean Air Act. So one more step back, the big picture. No, no. Why? Uh-oh. <laughs> Not yet. We're still hot. <clears throat> okay, the big picture. Whew. Boy. Okay, Title I. That's all we've been in so far is Title I. All right, Title I. Air quality planning is all we've done. This is it. Section 112 talks about hazardous air pollutants. We've talked about criteria pollutants. There's a whole other section in terms of dealing with over 100 hazardous air pollutants. We have no time to talk about that today, but you understand that Section 112 of the Act talks about hazardous air pollutants. The biggest one today we're talking about is mercury. Mercury from power plants is a big, big deal these days because it's so expensive to to control. So you'll see press on, on mercury emissions from, from coal-fired power plants hot in the press uh, in today and in the, in the coming months. Uh, new source performance standards is another uh, programmatic area by which you have emission control requirements separate from air quality planning for, for new sources. The enforcement provisions are in, in Title I. Uh, then you have the non-attainment and the PSD sections, which we touched on very briefly. That's, that's Title I of this monster, right? Aren't you glad we didn't start at the top? Title II, Mobile sources. There's a whole program dealing with regulating cars, vehicles, and the fuels that drive them. Very complicated, very long. We're not even going to touch it. Title three, general provisions. Oddly, this is where you get the good stuff. The definitions, for example. Like, what does all this stuff mean? It's all in Title three. So in a normal statute, you begin at the beginning, and you sort of get, a, you know, here's the purpose, the intent, and then some definitions to kind of help it. No. you got to read all this before you get to Title three. But it has the general provisions in it citizen suit enforcement and, and whatnot. Title IV, noise pollution. I just have never run across that. In 15 years of practice, I've just never run across a noise pollution case. I don't know. Title IV A, acid rain program. So we talked about acid rain a little bit, acid precipitation. There's a, there's a cap and trade program under the Clean Air Act that deals with the emission of, of uh, SO2 and also of, of NOx. Every ton of SO2 that comes out of a coal-fired power plant stack is given an allowance, right? And we restrict the number of allowances that are given out, necessarily restricting the number of tons that are emitted. If you have more allowances than tons, you can sell your excess allowances. If you have fewer allowances than you have tons, then you've got to go somewhere who, to someone who has excess ones and buy them. So there's this cap and trade market set up. It was, uh, it was enacted in 1990, and it is the precursor, of course, to the Kyoto Protocol's cap and international cap and trade program for CO2. Al Gore loved the 1990 amendments. Right? Al Gore loved the idea of a, a global cap and trade program. And so he, during the Clinton administration, was the, the, the principal author, um, at least from the American side. As someone's from, from UN Environment Program, I don't want to overstep my bounds here as an American, but I, you know, Al Gore was a big believer and a fan of cap and trade and really pushed that uh, during the, um, the sort of UN Framework Convention uh, discussions and the Kyoto Protocol discussions. But it, it started here in terms of a cap and trade program for, for SO2 sources. Operating permits are just what they sound like. Right? All the requirements that apply to a source, you put in one operating permit. Last but not least, you've got this stratospheric ozone protection program 
which eliminates CFCs uh, and similar compounds which have caused the hole in stratospheric ozone, not ground level ozone, this is stratospheric ozone. So stratos stratospheric ozone, good, right? Ground level ozone, bad. You just keep it like that. That's all I'm gonna talk about Title VI. Sorry, if you wanna know more, refer to the deep dive paper that I've given you. You can learn all you want about stratospheric ozone protection. Whew. Okay, that's the big picture. We're not gonna do any of that, right? But I wanted you to at least get a sense of the broader scope of, of the Clean Air Act. Any questions then about air quality planning or the big picture? Stunned silence greets me. I know, I went really fast on that slide. It's okay, catch your breath, I am. All right, well let's move on then. What I, what I like to do, because I, I like to sort of drive this home in a practical way, I have this, um, I've got this, um, case study that I like to do. Okay, let's take a really complicated controversial source, like a new coal-fired power plant, and let's pretend that we need to go get a permit, an air permit to, to build a new one, right? Really hard to do, really, really hard to do. And so it's a great case study because you pick a really hard thing to do, and then if you can do that, then you can do the easier ones as well. But we only have 20 minutes together, and we really can't go through this, but I wanted to show it to you because it's on the web, right? So the slides are on the web, so if you want to, you can go later on and take a look at it, or take a look at the, the deep dive memo that I put together to, to learn more about sort of what would happen uh, in a case study like this. So I'm just kind of skipping through all this. I want to show it to you. I don't know, maybe it's a teaser to come to boot camp next year. I don't know if you want to do it, but that's what we would, uh, that's what we could do if we had more time. Ah, oh, yes, the iceberg. Here we are, coming around the home stretch. Let's talk about greenhouse gases for a little while. Do you feel cooler? It's a nice picture. The projector's not very good, though. I mean, honestly, the, the water's really beautiful in this picture on my monitor in my office. It's sort of this green-blue kind of water. It seems very cool. And... Well, pressing on. Greenhouse gas regulation. Let's talk a little bit about what EPA has been up to in terms of greenhouse gas regulation in the last couple of years. Well, let's start, first of all, with the fiscal year 2008 Consolidated Appropriations Act. Holy cow, really? We're gonna do a Consolidated Appropriations Act? Yes, because Congress directed EPA to begin to collect data from sources of greenhouse gas emissions economy-wide, right? Congress knew back then, look, EPA's gonna to have to start regulating this stuff eventually, and we wanna know what's going on out there in terms of emissions of greenhouse gases. We had a lot of data already, but we didn't have a full data set from all kinds of sources. So EPA has now promulgated a rule, 40 CFR Part 98, that comprehensively requires many industries to report their GHG emissions, not just CO2, but all manner of stuff, all manner of greenhouse gases, um, industrial gases, fossil fuel combustion byproducts, so on and so forth. So if you emit more than 25,000 metric tons per year, in these 38 categories, maybe even more now, that EPA has designated, you have to file annual reports with the EPA on, on those emissions. It's not a Clean Air Act program, right? It's a, it's a creature of this Consolidated Appropriations Act, but it has to do with, with EPA's development of a Clean Air Act program for, for GHGs. Those reports have to, be, have to be sent in for the first time this year. EPA keeps getting extensions. Right now, I think the extension is, is September. They were supposed to be in, in I think, January but it's, it's difficult to roll this program out, and so we keep getting these extensions. So I think September is the current deadline for submitting the first year's worth of, of GHG um, uh, reporting. Any questions about that program? It's kind of a building block, you can see, for EPS programs. Yes, ma'am? Is it expected to stay in 2011, the It's a good question. It, you know, will it stay in 2011, or will it continue to slip? EPA is having a problem with its computer program that, that gathers all this information up. They keep saying they have it fixed, Everybody can use it and get trained on it and so on and so forth. I imagine it stays in 2011, uh, but I can't promise. It just depends on you know, whether they get all those bugs worked out. Mm -hmm. All right. Next. Massachusetts v. EPA, sort of the granddaddy of the court cases that have now caused the EPA to regulate GHGs under the Clean Air Act. I'm not going to go through all the background, but suffice it to say that for many, many years there was a dispute within EPA, within successive administrations at EPA, whether or not the Clean Air Act itself authorized the regulation of CO2 as a criteria pollutant or as any other kind of pollutant. So one general counsel would say, no, it doesn't. 
Then a different general counsel would say, yes, it does. And then they'd kind of go back and forth. And finally, the state of Massachusetts and a bunch of its friends in the environmental community had enough and filed a lawsuit uh, trying to so resolve the question for, for, uh, for good. And the Supreme Court, in a, in a divided uh, decision, 5-4 decision, um, opined that EPA actually has the authority to regulate CO2 under the Clean Air Act, that it must consider regulating. It didn't try to, it didn't drive a, 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 an outcome. It said, EPA, you, you, you do have the authority to do it, and you have the obligation to think about whether you should do it or not. And so as a result of, of that case, we have the, the, these, these elements. Greenhouse gases are an air pollutant under the Clean Air Act. EPA can't ignore its obligation to consider whether or not those air pollutants uh, cause or contribute to air pollution, which may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. EPA has to answer that question and ordered the EPA to answer the question. They gave EPA three choices. Number one, right, they do endanger. Number two, they don't endanger. Or number three, the scientific uncertainty is so profound that you can't make a conclusion one way or the other yet. So those are the three choices that the Supreme Court gave EPA. So as a consequence of, of those instructions, EPA then in 2009 made its endangerment finding. It actually concluded that CO2 emitted from new motor vehicles actually is reasonably anticipated uh, to adversely affect uh, or um, endanger human health and, and welfare. And so it made these findings. Human activities increased GHGs, climate's warming, we're doing it, right? And it's going to continue as we do something about it. And then goes through and describes the human health effects, right? So temperature has an impact on human health, right? Because hotter temperature makes people cranky, I guess. No, I mean, you know, obviously hotter temperatures have all, all manner of human health impacts. Air quality, because it gets hotter, you have more ozone days, and so that's going to impact. But these aren't direct from CO2, you see. These are sort of indirect human health impacts plant-sensitive disease, allergies, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And then you have a lot of welfare effects, these secondary effects. And this is what we're really talking about when people talk about you know, climate change. Sea level rise, water use impacts, uh, all manner of energy, agricultural impacts, the sort of the, 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 the big scary things that people talk about when we, when we mention climate change are these welfare-based effects primarily. Yes, sir? So that endangerment finding, as I understand it, was made under the Title II, the mobile sources mm -hmm. piece. But there's other endangerment language throughout the act, like NSPS says an endangerment. Once you make endangerment under one title, does that also make the same endangerment finding across the board? It does not. Okay. Yes, the question is, when you make the endangerment finding for Title II, doesn't that automatically trigger endangerment findings for other statutory sections that use some word like endangerment? The answer is, I think the answer is no. I'll look at this, this issue in detail. And the language in each of those sections is, is not identical. Very, very close, right? Very, very close. Maybe close enough practically to be the same thing, but not identical language. So EPA so far has said it's under no obligation to automatically make those findings under the other programs. They may be forced to make findings, just like a mass EPA court case. They may, they may be forced into making the findings, but so far they're saying, well, these extra little pieces of language and this, that, and the other, right, cause us to not have to make endangerment findings under these other programs. They would require separate analyses, separate decisions, and they haven't done that yet. So that's the endangerment finding. It's under review now in the DC Circuit. It's been challenged by a bunch of people, and it's now being litigated as to whether EPA should or could have made that finding. The third program, then, is as a result of that endangerment finding, EPA then uh, regulated GHGs from new motor vehicles. Well, that was why they made the endangerment finding, right? So having made the finding, now EPA must regulate new sources of GHGs from new motor vehicles. And so it's going to basically, it's, it's basically a fuel efficiency standard. Use less gasoline to drive the car a similar number of miles. Increases from 30 miles per gallon to 35 miles per gallon from 2012 to 2016, thereby using less fuel right, because there are no end of the tailpipe controls for CO2, just using less fuel means that you emit less CO2. So essentially, it's just a fuel efficiency standard. It's also under review in the DC circuit. It's also under review in the DC circuit. Questions then about the uh, mass EPA endangerment finding or the new motor vehicle rule, because those things kind of go together. Yes. 
people have trouble understanding if they said it's a, a pollutant, and then, then the EPA says it has to prove endangerment. What's the, you know, I would think that a pollutant automatically endangers human health. Well, so that was sort of what Judge Justice Scalia argued in the dissent to Mass v. EPA. He said, pollutant, it's got to be something bad. It, by definition, it has to be something that's bad. He said, CO2 gets emitted by us. We breathe CO2. You have these sort of naturally current substances. We can't call those air pollutants, can we? Majority said, yeah, an air pollutant is any chemical, any chemical substance, right? So water vapor. Right? If it's not there naturally, if, we're, if you're putting water vapor up in the air, that technically qualifies as an air pollutant under the Supreme Court's decision in Mass v. EPA. CO2, water, whatever. If it's, if it's, if it's being emitted by us, right, in some sort of process, not breathing, then it is technically an air pollutant. So then you have to answer the question, what does that air pollutant then endanger? Does that cause a problem? So it's a, it's a sort of two-part test. So Justice Scalia liked the idea, it makes more sense. Well, air pollution, that sounds like it's just all air pollution is bad, right? So it has to be something that's bad before it can be air pollutant, but the statute itself doesn't make that distinction. It actually just says, I forgot the exact language, but it's basically any physical or chemical uh, agent that is emitted into the atmosphere. That's a very grotesque shorthand paraphrase of the statute, but it's basically that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was just going to ask, um, so in order to Yes. Yes. Does that mean that the EPA has to go through and do this kind of process for each one of those kinds of pollutants, or does it have to make it the criterion pollution so that you can do the air quality testing? Excellent questions. We have slides on those coming up. Okay. Yeah, you know, it, it's the next step. Then, well, ha after having done this, then what does that mean for everybody else, other than sort of mobile sources, right? So hang on just one second, sure. and we'll do the next slide on that one. Other questions? That's a good one. Other questions on the light duty vehicle rule, endangerment finding, Mass v. EPA? Let's press on then to answer your question. All right. So then, now that we're regulating GHGs, now that we say that GHGs endanger public health and welfare, or human health and welfare, you know, there are a lot of bigger sources of GHGs than just cars. Right? What are we going to do about those? Do we have to go through the same endangerment finding? Do you have to find a specific hook for each of those different kinds of sources under the Act, like Title II's endangerment? The answer is no, because the PSD, pro and I guess the, the corollary question is, well, doesn't it automatically trigger all these other programs? Isn't it, is it now CO2 automatically a criteria pollutant? Isn't it automatically subject to control under the new source performance standards? Isn't it automatically included in the list of hazardous air pollutants? And so on and so forth. So the answer to your question is, not automatically, right? And the answer to your question is, but in some cases, it, it, can't, it can't actually be regulated, though not automatically. And one area in which there's sort of this semi-automatic application is the PSD program. Remember the Prevention of Significant Deterioration Program by which you can't build a new or modify an existing air pollution source without a pre-construction permit. And the reason that, you, uh, reason that gets triggered is because the PSD program gets triggered for any pollutant, quote, subject to regulation under this chapter, meaning the Act. So if there's any pollutant that's regulated under the Clean Air Act, a PSD program, a PSD permit applicant has to consider all of those pollutants in its PSD permit application. Not just criteria pollutants, but any, any pollutant subject, quote, subject to regulation under the Act. And because now CO2 is, quote, subject to regulation under Title II, as soon as that happened, then all PSD permit applicants had to consider GHGs in their permit applications for new and modified sources of air pollution, stationary sources, coal-fired power plants. I mean, anything that emits a certain amount of pollution now has to consider the GHG implications of building and operating that source. So it's not an automatic application, but, but pretty awfully close to an automatic application. Those other ones are not automatic, but this one was, was almost automatic. So EPA promulgated a rule clarifying when GHGs were subject to regulation. And they said January 2nd, 2011, when the motor vehicle rule came into effect, that's the day that CO2 GHGs were, quote, subject to regulation under the Act. And on that day, all the stationary sources that needed PSD permits had to think about GHGs before they could get their permit. 
Does that make sense? See how, how, how it all kind of fits together? So EPA didn't go all the way down the slippery slope, right, of describing CO2 as a criteria pollutant, for example, but it went sort of part way down and is now regulating a lot of major industrial sources under this subject to regulation approach of the PSD program. All right? Any? Yes, ma'am. So the question is, does uh, this, this, uh, this regulates new sources? How about old sources? It doesn't touch old sources. So the source has to trigger PSD in order for this to actually be a requirement. So if you have a pre-existing source that's just cooking along, you don't need to think about GHGs for a while. But if you undertake a major modification of that source, major modifications trigger PSD permitting requirements. If you undertake a major modification, what that is is almost anybody's guess these days. A lot of litigation on that over the last 10 years. Very uncertain as to what constitutes a major modification. But if you do, if you do, then you will have triggered uh, PSD, and then you now begin to think about, about GHGs. And do those permits have to be renewed? I don't know. Do they last for? So the permits need to be renewed. They do not. They're, they're, they're pre-construction permits. So it's a one-time permit. You, you, you get the permit before you undertake the construction or major modification and then you can do the major modification. The requirements of the permit get folded into an operating permit, which is then renewed, but the PSD permit is a one-time permit that you get before you commence construction. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so at the end of the slides where you have under review of DC circuit, does that mean someone's challenging? Yes, yes indeed. Yeah, so all these rules are under review in the DC circuit. I mean, you know, some people think they're not stringent enough, some people think they're too stringent, and so they're all tussling together in the D.C. Circuit uh, to figure out which rule is going to survive in what form. So that's the subject of regulation rule. We've got about five more minutes before we have to go. I think I've got maybe one or two more slides, so we're, we're getting close to the end here. So now, here's the problem with the subject to regulation rule. The PSD program applies to major sources, or major emitting units. Let's call them major sources, just for simplicity's sake. And those sources are described as those air emission sources that emit 100, or in some cases, 250 tons of an air pollutant in a year. Okay, a big apartment complex with a boiler is going to emit 100 or 250 tons of CO2 in a year. Dunkin' Donuts, when they, when they fire their big, you know, the big cooker vats, right, to, to make donuts with this, their big gas fire cooking vats, probably emit about that much. CO2 in a year just by combusting natural gas. My point is, very small sources can easily emit 100 or 250 tons per year of CO2. And so this subject to regulation rule means that all those sources have to go get PSD permits. Well, a PSD permit is not an easy thing to get. And if all these small sources had to go get PSD permits, they would just go out of business. They, they, couldn't, afford, they couldn't afford to pay my rate Right, to go, I, mean, I do a lot of this stuff. I go and I get PSD permits for clients. And they are very, very expensive, very elaborate. You've got to pay lawyers, you've got to pay engineers, you've got to pay technical consultants, you've got to have good relationships with the, with the air permitting agencies, you've got to go to EPA to make sure they're happy with it. Right? I mean, it's a very complicated kind of thing, suitable really for major, major sources. I mean, big industrial operations, not Dunkin' Donuts. So EPA was in a pickle because the statute says 100 or 250 tons. So EPA recognized that if they regulated all of those sources, that would be an absurd consequence or absurd outcome, absurd result uh, of, uh, of a strict application of the PSD program. So EPA said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're, we're not going to regulate 100 or 250 ton sources. We're going to regulate 75,000 ton sources first. Wait, 75,000 ton sources? You just sort of added a bunch of zeros and multiplied times three. These are statutory numbers. These are not suggestions by Congress, right? These are actual statutory numbers. And EPA says, well, we're going to phase it in. Phase one is going to be, you know, multiply times 100, right? And then times three again. And then phase two, okay, we'll, we'll get some more. And then phase three, then, gosh, we'll, we'll consider what to do in sort of the middle of 2012. And then maybe by 2016, we'll get around to sort of figuring out how we're going to address all these small, so don't worry Congress, we're going to get there eventually, but just because of administrative necessity, we need to have this phased approach. That's under challenge in the DC Circuit because it is, I mean look, my own thought, that seems to be pretty, pretty well at odds 
with what the statute commands in terms of what kinds of sources need to get permits. They either need to get permits or, or they don't need to get permits. And sort of stretching that out over the next five or six years, seven years, doesn't seem to me to be a particularly strong argument. Now, EPA may still win. Uh, it's the best they could do. And the Supreme Court gave them instructions, and those instructions had consequences that they had to comply with. I mean, I, I certainly understand their position. Um, I don't think anybody thinks the Clean Air Act as currently structured is a really effective way to, to, to manage greenhouse gas emissions. But when the Supreme Court tells you to do something, you're under something of obligation to at least try uh, to, uh, to follow their instructions. And so this is what EPA has done. And uh, that tailoring rule, tailoring the, the PSD program to sources that really need to be regulated first, and saving the small ones to last, if at all, is the way that EPA has tried to thread the needle here. It's an imperfect thread, I think, as you can see. Uh, and I think it's got significant litigation weaknesses. And if EPA wins on the subject of regulation rule and the motor vehicle rule, which means they're regulating GHGs, and loses on this one, it means that 100 and 250 ton sources nationwide have to get PSD permits. And that is politically unacceptable. That will, that will require Congress to do something about, about this problem. Right, which is in some ways the point. Right, enough on that. Um, so tailoring rule, 2010 under review now in the DC. Any questions about that? I know we're running a little bit out of time. Any questions of the tailoring rule? Why we have to have a tailoring rule and its it sort of weaknesses compared to congressional instructions on on actual um, PSD limits. All right. And then a bunch of states have different approaches to following the rules. Texas, Northeast states, so on and so forth. But uh, those are details that we're going to have to concern our, ourselves with right now. All right. Well, if you have other questions, uh, you can come see me afterwards. You've been, you guys have been great. I want to get you out right at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much.